Hello and welcome to the RCSI My Health series. My name is Leonie Young and I'm the Scientific Director of the Beaumont RCSI Cancer Centre and today we're going to talk about cancer. The My Health series explores a wide range of areas in health and well-being and brings together leading healthcare experts with the goal of empowering people with the knowledge they need to make informed decisions about their health and well-being. I'm joined today by Professor Patrick Morris, Medical Director of the Beaumont RCSI Cancer Centre and Consultant Medical Oncologist, and Dr Maeve Malouli, Senior Research Fellow and Health Research Board Emerging Investigator at RCSI University of Medicine and Health Sciences. Welcome to the RCSI My Health Series. So today we're here to discuss cancer. Cancer occurs when cells in the body grow uncontrollably and it can happen almost anywhere in the body, with almost 200 cancers identified to date. Primary cancers is a name given to the area where the cancer starts, but cancers can often move, known as secondary cancer or metastasis, and can be often more aggressive. Cancer is initiated by genetic changes within the cell. So these genetic changes can occur over the lifetime of the patient, or in some rare cases can be inherited from one's parents. Cancers are often staged or graded to give an idea about how much that they will grow and in what types of therapies that they may be suitable to be treated with. So cancers can be graded stage one. Stage one is when the cancer is small and the tumour is usually confined to the initial organ. In stage two, the tumour is bigger but still contained within that first organ. In stage three, the tumour is bigger again and we may see some infiltration into the surrounding tissue and nodes. Or stage four, where the cancer is large and may have moved to another organ or metastatic and this is more aggressive. Some cancer statistics, almost 45,000 people will get cancer in Ireland each year, meaning one in two will face a diagnosis of cancer within their lifetime. The most prominent cancers are skin, prostate, breast, bowel and lung. So Maeve, we might start with you. What are the common risk factors for getting cancer? So thank you for the opportunity to be here today and that's a great place to start. So risk factors are things that increase our risk of getting cancer. And it's important to note that just because we might have one or more risk factors, that does not mean that we will get cancer. But on the contrary, not having those risk factors does not necessarily mean that we won't get cancer. And so when we talk about risk factors, we typically talk about two main types and two main groups. And these include non-modifiable risk factors and modifiable risk factors. And so non-modifiable risk factors are so called because they are things that we cannot change. For example, as we age and as we get older, our risk of cancer increases. Then turning to modifiable risk factors, and these are things that we can modify. And these typically include things related to our environment or our lifestyles. So for example, modifiable risk factors include things like smoking, being overweight or obese, or being exposed to the sun. And are there types of cancers that can be prevented? So it's currently estimated based on existing evidence that approximately 40% of all cancers that are diagnosed could be prevented with effective preventive measures. But we know that cancer is a complex disease and further we know that cancer is not just one disease. So when we talk about cancer prevention, we talk about prevention across the spectrum of cancer from the stages of initiation all the way through to prevention of progression. So there are three main levels of cancer prevention that we talk about. And the first level is what we call primary prevention. And the goal of primary prevention is to prevent the cancer from developing or for, from forming. And so we do this by trying to avoid factors that cause cancer. So for example, preventing becoming in contact with something that causes cancer. And an example of this is, for example, asbestos. And it's, we know that it causes lung cancer. So the second level of prevention that we talk about is called secondary prevention. And so the goal of secondary prevention is to identify or detect the cancer at an early stage so that it can be treated in, or that we can get the most benefit from our treatment. And so a classic example of secondary prevention includes things like screening, where we try to detect the cancer at an early stage, but also we try to detect cancers when they're in a pre-malignant stage, so we stop them from becoming malignant. And then the third level of cancer prevention is tertiary prevention. 
And examples of tertiary prevention are when a, someone is diagnosed with a cancer and we try to prevent that cancer from becoming harmful to the patient so that they have an enhanced quality of life despite their cancer diagnosis. And in terms of hereditary or genetic cancer, are there any lifestyle factors that we can take into consideration to prevent getting cancer or to prevent the cancer being more aggressive? So we know that a proportion of cancers are as a result of an inherited predisposition or passed down from parents and it's estimated that approximately 5 to 10 percent of all cancers are be caused because of an inherited component and the majority of cancers therefore are not caused by an inherited component. So some examples of this include mutations in BRCA1 gene or BRCA2 gene. These are the bracket genes that increase our risk of getting uh, ovarian and breast cancer if there's a mutation in an inherited gene. And Maeve, just on this, what lifestyle changes can we take on to prevent cancer? So the European Code Against Cancer, which is an initiative developed by the WHO and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, have put all the evidence together and have come up with a number of recommendations that we can adopt in our daily lives to reduce our risk of getting cancer. And some of these recommendations include not smoking, not becoming overweight or obese, increasing our physical activity, but also maintaining a healthy diet, reducing our alcohol consumption, you know, having lots of fruits and vegetables. But it's also important that we engage in things like screening programs and we take up vaccinations, for example, for HPV to reduce our risk of getting certain cancers. So we can share the link with all those recommendations to anyone watching today. Thanks, Emil. And turning to you, Patrick, as a medical oncologist, what questions are you most frequently asked in your clinic? Well, thanks, Leonie, and a great opportunity to be here today. Many of our patients come to us after surgery, so they're coming with an early stage diagnosis. And one of the common questions we get are patients saying, well, I've had my surgery, my cancer is removed, why do I need further treatment? And as you've already mentioned, that really comes down to the, the risk that microscopic disease has already spread from the organ to somewhere else. And what I do as a medical oncologist is to give treatments to try and kill off those cells to enhance the chance of cure. And for your patients, as a patient, what would you recommend that they ask you when they first come to see you? I think some patients want more and some patients want less information. You've already explained around uh, stage and some patients do want a lot of detail around staging. But I think a more important question really comes down to whether the patient's cancer is seen as an early stage cancer or an advanced cancer. That very much changes how we approach our treatments. And I think that's one of the key questions that patients should ask. And with treatments changing so quickly, can you explain to us exactly what a clinical trial is and how a patient can access clinical trials? Sure. Um, well, clinical trials have really been the bedrock of, of medical oncology therapies. Clinical trials address new treatments, either new combinations and new drugs. And really it's about trying to improve on the existing therapies, either by curing more patients, controlling cancers better, or to find more selective therapies that are less likely to give side effects. The clinical trials differ from standard therapies and there's a lot of extra resources and a lot of extra work that goes into monitoring on a clinical trial because of their experimental nature. But it is also well known that in general terms patients on clinical trials do at least as well as patients outside of clinical trials. And that really speaks to the fact that we've, we've done a, a good job over the years in selecting different clinical trials. And in your experience, can you tell us a little bit about some new drugs that are coming on screen for several different cancers that you've had experience of in terms of clinical trials? Well, we used to think about chemotherapy, and, and we still do use chemotherapy for lots of different cancers. But broadly, the terms that we use as medical oncologists are systemic anti-cancer therapy, or SACT. And that really refers to a whole myriad of different treatments that we now have to fight different cancers. And some of those do still involve cytotoxic chemotherapies, the old-fashioned types of chemotherapy that many people will think of, as well as hormonal therapies that are trying to address the different hormone balances in the body. And increasingly things like immunotherapy, where we're using drugs to enhance the immune response to cancers so the patient's own immune system can fight off cancer cells, as well as targeted therapies which are really uh, addressing particular uh, growth factors on cancer cells or how, how cancers are growing. And this was the final group of, of, of exciting new drugs that we have our so-called antibody drug conjugates, where we're taking chemotherapy and binding it to immunoglobulins to more selectively target those therapies to uh, cancer cells and avoid some of the side effects of our prior older therapies. So these new therapies are better, but they're also kinder to the patient. 
Can you tell us a little bit about how you tailor a certain treatment to an individual patient? Yeah, so that, that's it really in a, in a nutshell, that our, our approach to cancer has evolved massively over the last number of years. As you've already alluded to, there's maybe 200 different types of cancer, and classically we thought of breast cancer and lung cancer and bowel cancer, but increasingly we're recognising that each of those are not one entity. And because of our understanding of cancer biology, we've learned subclassifications of all these different cancers. So we're using that information to know about how high patients' risk is, how their cancer might behave in the future, as well as now to develop new therapies that are particularly targeting these particular cancers. When we approach the overall picture from, from a patient, we do consider the cancer stage. As I've already said, whether it's considered an early stage or an advanced cancer, uh, we consider other factors in terms of the cancer biology. But it's very important to look at the individual and how we approach somebody who is 70, maybe very different to how we approach somebody who is 40 with the same cancer, as well as considering some of the patient's comorbidities. So for example, if they have some side effects from diabetes or heart disease, we might be less likely to give certain therapies that could cause some side effects that would be more detrimental to those patients. Okay, that, that makes sense. And wh what would you recommend a patient to do before that they start a treatment, such as these targeted therapies? I think it's important to get as much information and I would look at that as a journey over several different meetings. I often find that when patients come in they have a, a meeting with myself and one of my colleagues, there's a lot of information given to them and I often encourage people to take that information home, talk it over with their family and come back. And I think that that really makes a big difference in the longer term. If the patient's already seen a surgeon and radiation oncologist and then they're seeing the medical oncologist, getting the same information digesting it over time, weighing up the pros and cons. And some patients really do want their doctors to be quite direct and say, look, I don't know about this, what would you recommend? You have my best interest at heart. And some patients want more of the detail in terms of the, the differences between one treatment and another. And I suppose my job as a doctor is really to try and get that balance right, to give patients as much information as they want, but not overwhelm them. And at the end of the day, to give them what will be an, an important, the right, personalised individual therapy for them. Okay, thanks so much. And just on that, Maeve, are there lifestyle changes that the patients can take into consideration to prepare themselves for treatment? So this is a very active area in research. And what we're seeing at the minute is the importance of physical activity and maintaining a healthy weight to help patients get through their treatment and particularly to offset some of the side effects of treatment so that they can better manage their treatment but also they can be stronger for recovery and also getting past their diagnosis. So the, the side effects are something that every patient is concerned about. Patrick, what are the common side effects that patients can expect? Well, I suppose some of our older drugs are, are the classic type side effects. Many of our, our chemotherapy drugs unfortunately still cause hair loss. There can be fatigue, Big things that we worry about as doctors are the risk of low blood counts, particularly low white blood cells, because they make you more prone to infection. Um, in many areas, we've made major progress. Our treatments of things like uh, anti-sickness medications is radically improved year on year. So in general terms, nausea is something that we can, can control. Other things, some of our treatments cause neuropathy, which are problems with the nerves, typically the fingers and toes. And then there are the rarer risks that we'll be monitoring patients for in terms of other problems, say, with the lungs, the heart, the kidneys. So, Maeve, are there additional supports available for patients going through these types of therapies? So this is a very important question, particularly for cancer patients as they're going through their journey, because we know that cancer is a physical disease, but also it impacts their emotional and social well-being. So it's so important that cancer patients seek a cancer support for these components. And for example, there are many cancer support centres that are dotted around the country that patients can freely access to get additional support both for themselves and for their families as they go through their cancer journeys. And these cancer support centres offer things like as far as a cup of tea all the way up to complementary therapies. And they can have a huge impact on a cancer patient while they're going through the different stations of their cancer journey from all the way up to their diagnosis as they go through their treatment and even when they're moving beyond their treatments to try and return to their normal life. And just on families, what can people do if their loved ones are going through a diagnosis of cancer? It's so important that families aren't afraid and that they're not afraid to 
ask a patient if they need anything, if they want anything. But it's also so important that they can offer practical support, that they can offer social support, that they can offer emotional support to help them get through. And there's a number of resources within these cancer support centres that families can access for themselves, but also to learn about how they can best help a cancer patient as that patient progresses through treatment. So Maeve, thanks so much for that. I think that's really helpful. So finally, Patrick, I just really wanted to ask you about the impact of research and where you see cancer treatments being pioneered. I think research is really important to everything that we do. Everything we do now in terms of our treatments is based on research done in the past. And what we're really striving to do with ongoing research is to further personalise and individualise our therapies for the future. We know that some of our research has led to patients receiving less toxic therapy and being spared side effects. We also know that research is leading to new therapies that are increasing cure rates and increasing cancer control. So there's lots of different areas that we're involved in and I think it's important that patients ask about the possibility of, of getting a clinical trial. And we're sitting here in a beautiful Beaumont or CSI Cancer Centre. Can you tell me about some of the work that's ongoing here? Sure. So the Beaumont RCSI Cancer Centre is made up of Beaumont Hospital, the RCSI, as well as the St. Luke's Regional Oncology Network on the Beaumont campus. And together these institutions are really trying to strive for excellence, to pioneer cancer care in clinical care, in education and research. And part of our, our new structures really involve higher level of support to develop more research, to offer more patients clinical trials, so that overall for the future we can give patients a better experience. So finally, in wrapping up today's discussion, I think we can all agree that the future for cancer patients is looking ever brighter. Maeve, what are your final thoughts? So when we think about cancer, it's important to remember that some types of cancer can be prevented. So we should try and do everything we can to reduce our risk of cancer in our daily lives. And as I mentioned before, some of those modifiable risk factors that we can adopt in our daily lives, things like not smoking, things like increasing our physical activity, not becoming overweight or obese, or not gaining weight. And all of these factors can really influence our risk of cancer. So it's important that we adopt them to our daily lives. Thanks so much. And Patrick, a take home from you? I would say that it's important for patients to have an understanding of how advanced their cancer is to look at the different treatment options, surgery, radiation, or systemic therapy. And then within those options, to try and tease out the different um, options that they have for different types of treatment. And at the end of the day, if patients are struggling to process all this information, ask their doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals about what their advice should be. Ask about the possibility of clinical trials, and there's a lot of resources out there that we can help patients tap into. Thank you so much. And just a reminder of that, that all the websites will be available at the end of this. So that concludes our discussion for today. So on behalf of RCSI, the Beaumont RCSI Cancer Centre, I would just like to say thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Maeve. So further details about upcoming events at the RCSI My Health series can be found at the RCSI website. So from all of us here, thank you for watching and stay safe.